H3 music. Is this serious? Are we actually being serious? Sports! Yay! It's insanity! Ah, welcome into Cole's Corner. It's me, your host, Cole Johnson. Thank you for listening, however you may be listening, live from WMCB The Fuse, home of the Mavericks. Good afternoon. Wow, a lot of good sports. This weekend, got to see Alabama LSU again. Didn't turn out how we wanted it. We'll get to that in a bit. Uh, we had crazy NFL games, a good week. We had the LA and New Orleans, big matchup, battle of the NFC. And then we had Brady and Rodgers, New England and Green Bay. And then, hey, college basketball starting tonight. Battle of the Blue Bloods. We got Michigan State and Kansas, Duke, Kentucky. It's going to be a good one. We'll, we'll start with this. It was Battle of the Goats that took place on Sunday night. Everyone tuned in. It was the hottest Sunday night game we were going to get in a while. Uh, and Look, you have your GOAT battles throughout history. The GOAT, greatest of all time. You got your Magic and Bird, Jordan and LeBron, DiMaggio and Williams are going way back. Today, Trout and Harper for a couple years. It's, you know, and then there's the Montana and Brady discussion. But the one that has taken this generation by storm has obviously been Brady and Rodgers. Rodgers and Brady, Brady, Rodgers. It's a never-ending tale of who is the better quarterback, the better overall player. Well, folks, I'm going to start by wiping out that debate between players in different eras. LeBron and MJ, Brady, Montana, you can't compare. You can't. The games have changed so fast. They change so often. You can't really... truly decide who is better you just can't and and with Brady and Rodgers there's also a dilemma I mean yes right now they're playing each other they're in the same era right now but look at this and Aaron Rodgers was drafted in 2005 and he then sat behind Brett Favre for three seasons three full seasons by the time Aaron Rodgers became the starting quarterback for Green Bay Brady had already won three Super Bowls and had been to four Brady had already cemented his spot in history as one of the greatest to ever play the position. So off the bat, Rodgers already had a disadvantage. He, he did take the league by storm. His, his athleticism and talent really showed to a lot of people early. He won a Super Bowl in just two seasons and the 2010-11 season. Turned heads. Uh, he, he was an excellent athlete at his position. Everyone knew that and that's when this began. And he framed what it was like to move in and out of the pocket, make plays longer. Uh, he's a good ad-libber, uh, making things happen that shouldn't happen. Uh, throwing on the run, he's got a terrific arm. There's no doubt, no doubt whatsoever that Aaron Rodgers is a transcendent quarterback in this league. And he is, I think he's deserving of the money that he just got in his recent contract. The problem here is, how does he match up to Brady when it comes to winning Super Bowls? As we look at all the individual accolades, we can look at how they play, who they beat here. It, it, it comes down to winning. Because let's face it, Brady has Rodgers beat by a mile, a mile and a half in that category. Eight Super Bowl appearances, five Super Bowl wins, including the greatest comeback in Super Bowl history. Rodgers has one appearance, one ring, that's it. So you tend to negate all the winning and losing, like I said, uh, and we focus on them individually as players. But but here's the thing with that. You can't truly do that without them being on the same team, with the same players, with the same system. Brady and Rodgers have played with different teams and different systems. See, what if you put LeBron James in his first seven years, maybe with the Lakers, let's say, where, where Kobe Bryant, where he played, instead of Cleveland? He probably has a few more rings. If LeBron James is in that on that Lakers team playing with Shaq, he might have a couple more rings. What if you put Mike Trout, probably the best player in baseball today, who no one is talking about. What if you put him on the Red Sox or Astros in the past couple of years? He, he, he's, he's exposed more. He might have a couple rings. He's the most overlooked player in, the, in Major League Baseball. Yeah, he, he is the best player. He's still overlooked because he's on the Angels who haven't made the playoffs since 20 they've made the playoffs one time since his rookie year in 2011 
some 70% of people don't even know who he is. He's the, probably the best player in Major League Baseball overall. You see what I'm getting at? If you put Rodgers in the Patriots organization, he probably succeeds. He probably has overall better numbers records than he has had in Green Bay. But does he exceed what Brady has done? And I don't think you can determine that because they simply have different intangibles. What works for the Patriots works for Brady. Because he has those skill sets to move the ball, move the chains, and score a lot of points. And doing that with a lot of no-name players who have not succeeded in other organizations. That's how this Patriots team runs. And he's turned small known players into superstars. Wes Welker, Julian Edelman, Danny Amendola. I could go on forever. Has Aaron Rodgers done that? I mean, he's been given some pretty good weapons in his years. And uh, Greg Jennings, R Randall Cobb. He, uh, he, he, and you, you could argue that Rodgers made Jordy Nelson a household name. They had a great connection. Jordy Nelson hasn't done a lick on the Raiders. Sure. But also, the only outstanding player Brady has ever worked with is Randy Moss. And that was for about a year and a half. And in that short time, they broke records. A lot of records. They were a part of a 16-0 regular season team. They were one ridiculous play from the New York Giants away from going 19-0 and winning the Super Bowl. Would have been Brady's. He'd have six now. It was, fire, it was a fireworks show in New England. If he has Moss for his entire career, I, I can't even imagine. And and here's a point in favor of Aaron Rodgers. When it comes to the front office and who's more aggressive, who wins that battle? New England, easy. New England, every time they are short a player, what do they do? They go get somebody. They've done it every year. This year, they go and get Josh Gordon. He gets let go by Cleveland. Oh, we got you, Josh. He, he scored the touchdown that sealed the game on Sunday night. And what have the Packers done to improve their roster? Nothing. And that's one thing where Aaron Rodgers may have a case and where I agree with that. The Green Bay Packers have done nothing for Aaron Rodgers. He is he, he has been a one-man show for a lot of his career. When it comes to making plays, he doesn't have a lot. He never has a defense. See, bottom line, it's almost impossible to truly and effectively compare two players, especially with so many gray areas in between. And there's other things to look at, too. Stats. Let's look through. Aaron Rodgers has had 11 complete seasons in this league. He has 41,044 yards passing. Brady, through his first 11 seasons, we are going to take out his injury season. He got hurt in week one. If you use all of his first 11 full seasons, Brady, 44,800 yards. So he already beats Rodgers in in in, the, in that category. Touchdowns as well. And then other things. Uh, who's more likable? Tom Brady. He's personable. Who takes a pay cut every year for his team? Tom Brady. Aaron Rodgers made a boatload of money. You, I, you think he's going to take a pay cut? Uh, I don't know. And here's another thing. Who's to say Brady doesn't play longer than Aaron Rodgers does? It sounds crazy. I, I, I believe it. But, but listen, Brady has kept in great shape. He's never hurt. He doesn't look anywhere close to being 41 years old. He hasn't been hurt since the season-ending injury a decade ago. Aaron Rodgers hasn't finished a full season in a few years. He got hurt in, again in week one this year, and he's been wincing ever since. It may sound crazy when you first hear it, but think about it. See, here's my thing. I think Aaron Rodgers is an absolutely amazing player at his position. That is for sure. He is one of the few QBs in this league that you can say that you're intimidated to play because you're scared to play him because you don't know what he can pull out of his back pocket in any given play, especially down in, in crunch time. And overall, he's more athletic than Tom Brady. I would admit to that. But to me, regardless of your pieces around you, how good or bad your defense is, it's about winning and the rings at the end of the day. Tom Brady is a flat-out winner. He's the face of a franchise that has dominated the league for a 17-year period, which will never be matched again in history. I can't see it, especially the way the NFL is turning to now. I don't see it happening. And truth be told, he has a chance to win it all again this year. 
This this year and the next couple years, Tom Brady has a chance to add to that stack, add to that trophy room. It's not even a trophy case. He's got a trophy room. And pile that on top of this debate against Aaron Rodgers. The Packers have no chance this year. And who knows what will be coming their way in the future either because simply the Packers have done nothing to improve their roster recently and I don't see it happening anytime soon. They had a chance at the trade deadline, did nothing. And now they have to pay Aaron Rodgers a lot of money. See, Aaron Rodgers got such a late start to the debate, it's hard to compare him to a man who had already been in the Hall of Fame. Tom Brady is already a Hall of Famer by the time Aaron Rodgers steps foot as a starting quarterback. Rodgers is late to the party. Therefore, I, I don't think it's that much of a discussion. We can debate it all we want. We can get into the, the thousand plus tweets, threads of tweets. Like I saw the other night, a bunch of stupid stuff coming from both sides. Both arguments. I saw a lot of stupid stuff. But it doesn't change the fact that Tom Brady was winning before Rodgers even got in the league. And he's still winning today. And that's it. Let's shift to this. See, it's time for the higher fires of the week. Uh, top 10, top 10 teams of the week. It's shaking it up just a little bit. Not too many changes. Maybe, uh, I mean, there's a change at the top, and I'm sure you know what it is, but we'll get to that. Uh, here we go. Roll it. Higher fire. Uh, see, this was the first team I thought of when sneaking into the top 10 for the first time. After this weekend, the Atlanta Falcons. I mean, for real. Why haven't we talked about this team all year? They started 1-4, and four, and I think everyone wrote them off. But what we don't realize is that this team's losses outside of Pittsburgh, where they got smoked, were all one-score games. They got stopped on the fourth down in the red zone in the opener at Philly. Lost in overtime to a Saints team that's the best team in football right now. And, and their run-down, really beat-up defense a couple... A few weeks ago, let up a go-ahead touchdown in the final seconds against Cincinnati. On an outstanding drive by Andy Dahl, and he looked out of his world. The last three games, they can't be stopped in offense. They're right back in the stacked division known as the NFC South. But watch out, Carolina. Only concern is that defense. Falcons at 10. Number 9. They had an ugly performance in Denver on Sunday. They got a lucky missed field goal as time expired. But a win is a win, and this team has won six straight. The Houston Texans, the only other team with six straight wins, is the best team in football right now in the Saints. They have weapons on offense for Deshaun Watson. They just got Demarius Thomas to make up for the injured Will Fuller. We'll see how that plays out. They have a good defense, and they are playing in a division that is down this year. Only team that has a realistic shot at the division is Tennessee because of their win last night in Dallas. They have a bye this week, then head to Washington. Texans at 9. Number eight, the Minnesota Vikings. Here, I struggled to put them at eight originally. They are 5-3-1, but it's not a very pretty 5-3-1. First of all, they failed to score more than six points and lost to a Buffalo team at home. And, and then haven't been able to perform fully against top teams in the NFC. Although they did shoot it out with the Rams, it was a very entertaining game. Some, there's some guys in this team, including their quarterback, Kirk Cousins, that's hard to trust. They are, they are outstanding defensively on Sunday at Detroit, and that's going to be their rock. Moving forward, the biggest question is whether Kirk Cousins can rise to the occasion in big games. They have a bye week coming up this week, and then they have two big division games followed by New England. It's going to get b big for them. Vikings at 8. 7. The LA Chargers have been overlooked for the past two seasons. And honestly, I, th I think I'm overlooking them by putting them down at seven. They could be very well be higher. This team is five, 15 and five since last November, and the only games they've lost are to Kansas City, New England, and the Rams. Phillip Rivers is the most underrated quarterback in the league. They have arguably the best roster up and down in the league. They just established themselves as a legitimate playoff team with a win at Seattle on Sunday who was a hot team coming in that game to start with. Second of all, it's not easy to win midway through the season on the road in Seattle. Very tough place to play. 
they have the Raiders, Broncos, and Chargers moving forward, and they're already 6-2. and two. They could very well be 9-2 and two after these next three weeks. They have a great chance heading into the Week 16 matchup with the Chiefs to have a shot at that division. Chargers at 7. 6. Staying in the same spot. There's no really one team they could jump over, but they played like crazy this week. See, everyone thought Cam Newton's window was closing. The Panthers, they're letting go of their ranks in the NFC South after a couple disappointing seasons. Well, folks, Cam Newton is on pace to be the MVP quarterback he was in 2015 when he took the Panthers to a 15-1 and a trip to the Super Bowl 50. He is having his best season in completion percentage at 63, 67%, and he's just behind his MVP season in touchdown percentage and interception percentage. He's only thrown four picks. He's doing this without a lot of outstanding weapons on the outside. He does have Christian McCaffrey, who's coming out of the backfield and has become one of the best dual threat running backs in the league, that's for sure. Their offense scored 35 points in the first half on Sunday. Their offense has been great other than in weeks one and the loss to Washington. They still have a great front seven on defense. They have a short week going to Pittsburgh on Thursday. Should be a good one. Panthers at six. Ah, now number five. I so badly wanted to drop the Steelers down in this list, especially with a loss to Baltimore. But they won on the road in Baltimore in a big division game. James Conner continues to do his thing. Big Ben is throwing darts to his weapons. Antonio Brown and Smith Schuster. They are still an immensely intriguing team to watch. And like I said last week, they just have that it factor when it comes to late season and playoff push. It's the Pittsburgh way. It has been for decades. The only question that remains is if they can beat the Patriots and the Chiefs in the playoffs. They gotta be disciplined. That's been their one downfall. Steelers at five. Four. They still have the best weapons in football for Patrick Mahomes, who continues to throw touchdowns with ease. Mahomes is two touchdowns away from breaking the single-season touchdown record for the Chiefs in 10 games, which was done in 14 games prior. It's the Kansas City Chiefs. They didn't expose the Browns like we expected. They kept it close for a while, but they did, they did what the Chiefs haven't done in the past, which is finish games. So for that, they are still one of the best teams in the league. The concern is their defense. If, if they have an off day offensively, can this defense hold teams and still win the game? Their history of losing in the second half of the season and the lone loss coming in New England is why they sit at four as opposed to the top three, but they're still a scary good team in this AFC. Chiefs at four. Three, it's the New England team that we have become accustomed to for 17 years. They struggle in September, the September shakies we'll call them, but that's them. They need time to figure out who fits where in their system and then they hit their stride in October and November. They've done just that. If you look at Tom Brady and the way he runs that offense, you can't tell it apart from 7, 10, 12 years ago. It's the same system, discipline, fundamentals, execution that has won them 8 AFC titles in that span. It's the we are smarter than you, we will make less mistakes than you, and we will wear you down in the fourth quarter mentality. That's the Patriot way. They're 7-2, they're playing great football. It, it, watch out, it's Tom Brady's time. Patriots at three. Number two. Ah, the Rams finally lost, man. Eh? No way. Well, well, here's the thing. They weren't outcoached. They weren't run off the field. They were not outmatched against the New Orleans Saints. That was a very evenly matched football game. They, they simply couldn't get a stop on third down against Drew Brees. Their lack of pressure from the front lost them that game. They've matched up evenly against the Saints' weapons, and it was it was just destined to be a shootout. Sean McVay took a huge risk on a fourth down like you'd expect him to do. That's him. That's who he is. Unfortunately, they were inches short. Arguably, I thought he had the first down. If they get that, they probably score, and, and, and then they missed a field goal later on. If they convert both of those things, it's a completely different game. It's different than having to come back from down by three scores. They still had the power to come back. They had the integrity to make a comeback, make it a game, and it's the reason they are still a very, very good football team. But they finally surrendered the one spot to the new best team in football right now. Rams at two. And here it is. I told you last week that game on Sunday would determine who was going to be the best team. I told you it'd be a shootout, and I told you that Drew Brees would come to play. The Rams could not get Brees in that offense attack off the field. Michael Thomas asserted himself as 
a top wide receiver in this league, Alvin Kamara continued to dom his dominance out of the backfield, running and receiving. This is a good, good football team. They lost week one, almost lost to Cleveland in week two, and everyone panics. Everyone's like, oh no, here we go again. Folks, this team has now won seven straight, and it doesn't seem to be looking like they're going to look back anytime soon. They control their own destiny in the NFC South. They've already taken out the Rams. They have an avenge tour. They thought last year was their year. Big mistake late cost them their season. Things are looking good, and they're looking good for the best QB and head coach tandem in the NFC with Drew Brees and Sean Payton. Saints at one. So, there we go. There's your higher flyers for the week. And we move on. Uh, let's shift to this. Um, so, being aggressive. I, I've talked about it before. It's Being aggressive is very important. It's, it's, it's not sitting back and waiting for something to happen. You have to go and get it. In, in, in sports leagues, in professional sports, you got to go and get it. And you've seen it in the past. You saw it last year, the Houston Astros. They were a great baseball team. They go out and get Justin Verlander late in the season. L look what happens. He ends up being an MVP. They win the World Series. He was lights out as an Astro. This year, Dodgers, they go out and get Manny Machado. They were struggling for a bit. They, they hit their stride. Machado comes in. They're even better offensively. And they go to the World Series. Don't get it done again, but they did it. Uh, you see it. Guys, they, and just, and that's the thing about the NFL and the teams we see dominating right now, they got aggressive. The Kansas City Chiefs traded all the way up to get Patrick Mahomes. And look where that's taking them. The Rams, they traded up. They had a first round pick for Jared Goff. This was a terrible team before 2016, and they've turned it all the way around. They were 8 0 before this week. Folks, be aggressive. You have to in sports. And let's just take this trade deadline, for example. Who are the teams that went out and got good players? Uh, quite a few of them are already teams that are already set, succeeded, but they're looking for more. The Rams, go, they go out again. The Rams making moves. They go out and get Dante Fowler, extra pass rusher. Takes, more, takes less attention off of Nadama and Sue and Aaron Donald up the middle. Texans. They, they get an injury, boom, we're, we're hopping in. We go and get Demarius Thomas to fill the void of Will Fuller, deep threat down the field. Eagles, they've been struggling, but they, they know what they're struggling with. They go and got Golden Tate. They got aggressive. Redskins needed some help defensively. They go and get HaHa -Ha Clinton Dix from the Packers, who, by the way, didn't make any moves other than trading away HaHa -Ha Clinton Dix and Ty Montgomery. Cowboys go and get Amari Cooper. They've had... Trouble their offense moving the ball with receivers. They go and make a move. Amari Cooper scored a touchdown last night. Had a decent game. See, this Rams team now has an elite front defensively, backed by secondary with Marcus Peters and Oki Pelee. Add that to the offense they have with a breakout rookie from last year in Cooper Cup. No one heard of him until last year. They, they go and get Brandon Cooks, another weapon for golf, to go along with Robert Woods. And then they have the potential MVP and Todd Gurley in the backfield. They are stacked. And we talk about their transition. This was a team that was struggling for years and years. And when they changed to Los Angeles, some people didn't like it. A lot of some people did like the change back to LA, but it was turmoil in St. Louis. They got aggressive. They get the one pick. They go and get Jared Goff. Had a terrible first year. Some people thought he was a bust. They thought it was the worst pick in history. Well, then they go and get Coach Sean McVay. He brings this team to the playoffs. They had a great season last year. And you're doing this with a very young Todd Gurley and a second-year quarterback in Jared Goff who made a complete 180 from his rookie season. Then they go out and they're saying, we're, we're going now. We're getting aggressive. They go get... Peters, Tlaib, Ndamukong Sue, Brandon Cooks. And, and, and while this is happening, Goff and Gurley are getting that much better. Sean McVay is getting that much smarter. And this is a team who has a chance to run through the rest of this 
league and win a championship. But here's the thing. They may have a tight window to win. It sounds crazy, but with, especially with all the young talent, it sounds crazy, but it's why this year is so important for Sean McVay and this organization. And, and that's where you have to set a goal. Is this year's goal the Super Bowl? Is this year's goal to win the Super Bowl, get to the Super Bowl, get to the NFC title game? Because last year they got they got stomped in the wild card. They thought they were going further, got stomped wild card. The thing is, and why I say their window might be a little tight, I'm, I'm, it's not 100%, but if you look at it, there's a lot of studs on this team. And, and the fact of the matter is they're not going to be able to play all of these guys in the next couple years. They are still under the salary cap, and they're dealing with a lot of rookie contracts. There's something I saw before the season started, and they're paying for a combined Jared Goff, Todd Gurley, Aaron Donald, and there's someone else. All of those, the Rams are paying them combined less than the New York Giants are paying Eli Manning. And the Giants are 1-7. And that's a core of their team right there. Those are three of their best players. Goff, Gurley, and Donald. And they are being paid combined less than an Eli Manning who is leading a 1-7 in seven New York Giants football team. These are some young studs. These are some things to think about. If Gurley goes out and wins MVP, Aaron Donald could go out and win Defensive Player of the Year. Jared Goff's going to get a few... Votes for best quarterback, even some MVP votes possibly. Tack those contracts along with some of the other key pieces they have gotten. Uh, you got to pay Cooks. They're eventually going to have to pay Cooper Cup as well if they want to keep him. See, the front office did their job in creating a championship caliber team. Now it's up to the team and Sean McVay to go get it done. And what we've seen so far, it definitely can be. Sean McVay, McVay has been a He's really he's a transcendent coach in this league. And he's the most aggressive guy you see and he makes awesome moves. He's got a great scheme, great system. They have to go out and get it. If not, it's, it it could get messy in the next couple of years. It really could. There's 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 a lot of money being thrown around there. It, it is an LA market. They may be able to handle it, but just that's something to think about and something to look at moving forward the rest of this season for the Rams. All right. All right, we're gonna we're, we're gonna hit it with a cooler fool, um, or fool. Ready? We're ready. Cooler fool. All right. So this past week, Matt Patricia, I got another Matt Patricia thing. He, he called out a Detroit reporter and oppressor. Um, he basically he he must have been slept on the wrong side of the bed. I don't know. He he wasn't excited. He. He went at this journalist for poor posture. Yeah. Let's take a listen. Um, well, you know, I mean, give me a favor. Just kind of sit up. Just like, have a little respect for the process. Every day you come and ask me questions, and you just kind of like, you know, give me this. But I mean, like, just, just be a little respectful. Just, I'm asking just to be a little respectful in this whole process, okay? So ask me a question professionally, and I'll answer it. Okay? Yeah, that, that's Matt Patricia. Um... Well, then they go and get spanked again. They've, they've looked terrible the last two weeks. They they got back to 3-3. Three and three. They were looking decent. They're like, hey, maybe the Lions could compete in the NFC North this year. Ah, uh, wrong. Uh, they had a home game against Seattle. Got completely dominated at home by Seattle. Second time, time they've been dominated at home this year. And th this is coming off beating New England. I, I don't know. It's weird to me. And, th and then this week... Head to Minnesota in a big divisional game, and they just got completely outmatched. Absolutely. Minnesota dominated that game from the start. They, they couldn't even get the ball past midfield. Uh, and Matt Patricia, and, and, and then the newspaper comes out, and the, <laughs> the, the headline was poor posture. <laughs> kind of stab at uh, Matt Patricia. But listen, Matt Patricia, fool. Fool right now. It, he just he he looks like an assistant coach. He's not a head coach. He's he he's still a Belichick assistant. He still is. And this is coming from a guy who 
came out in the opening game of the season, Monday Night Football. Everyone's looking at you, and he's over on the sideline with a backwards hat on and a pencil in his ear. Look like a frat boy. It's Matt Patricia, and he's calling out a reporter for posture when they're asking him a question at the stand. Come on. Fool. Foolish. Foolish. All right. Let's get to this. Final dollar take. Uh, after talking about Brady and Rodgers, uh, talking about the Patriots a little bit, uh, they're up to three in my higher fire. They, this New England franchise, it's just been so fun to watch. And coming from someone who's not a New England fan, um, it's I typically don't like to see the same teams win. I and it's funny what we're going to get into here in this last segment. It's about teams who have been dominant in today's game. And you, de- I, myself, you, you want to see them lose sometimes. You love the upset. You love the upset stories. But it's also you have to live in the moment. And you have to realize that you are living during a through a dynasty that may never be repeated again. And... As I say that, it's not just New England right now. They've dominated for 17 years. Since 2001, when Tom Brady came onto the scene, New England has been the best football team for 17 years now. And they've won five Super Bowls. They've been to eight. They're one, two plays away from winning seven, even all eight of them. And through and through, you also have... A couple dynasties down there on the college level. And one that just began a few years ago in the NBA. The Golden State Warriors has becoming a dynasty. And if they keep that group together, that could go on for a long time. They've won three of the last four titles. They've won two straight. Steph Curry, Clay Thompson, Draymond Green, that core guys who now have Kevin Durant. That's a scary team that could be moving forward. It could be another New England Patriots in the NBA. Um, In baseball, we haven't really had one since the Yankees in the late 90s, early 2000s. We're looking at college basketball right now, and you still have a... We're living in a UConn women's basketball. This is a UConn women's basketball team that had the longest streak in history, It was a winning streak that lasted from November 2014 all the way to March of 2017 when they lost on a buzzer beater in the Final Four to Mississippi State. And that's not their only streak. They had one prior to this that lasted over 90 games. This is a team coached by Gino Ariema that has built a long-lasting organization over there at UConn that is not ending anytime soon. All the best players in the nation are going there because they want to win. Then you look over to college football, Alabama football, led by Nick Saban. Saban, excuse me. This this is an Alabama Crimson Tide team that since 2008 has dominated, really. Absolutely dominated. And they play in the SEC, one of the the best conference in the nation. And they dominate that as well. And they they only have 14, 15 losses since 2008. It's every year they're a shoo-in for maybe a one-loss team. They're a, co- they're a playoff team. They won three out of four BCS National Championships from 2009 to 2012. Then once the college football playoff kicks off, they've now won two of the last three. This is a team... That like UConn women's basketball, they're getting all the best players in the country. And when you tie these dominant franchises together, there's three words, one thing in common. It's just win. We're better than you. We will be smarter than you. We will play faster than you, hungrier than you, uh, tougher than you, and we will wear you down. And that's how these teams play. And it's just something that somehow other organizations in pro sports, other teams across, it's a little different in college. In the the NFL, NBA, MLB, NHL, it's 
weird to see that teams haven't followed other dynasties and how they run their organization. Following, seeing the Patriots do it, seeing seeing the Bulls in the 90s do it, the Celtics and Lakers in the 80s. It's weird not seeing teams follow suit. In college, it's a little different because, like we said, you're getting all the best recruits in the country. It's hard to compete with that until you start beating them and then you start to spread the wealth a little bit. But there's three things here. Discipline, fundamentals, execution. It's something that I've seen in the New England Patriots watching them closely for the last 17 years. I'm still young. I'm 21 years old. I've been watching football since I was probably six years old. And it's I, this football team has been the best team in the AFC for m- majority of those years ever since I started watching football. And the crazy thing is they already had won two Super Bowls before I ever really got into it. They won it in Super Bowl 36 and and then 38 and that was when I was still in first grade I wasn't fully into it yet it was until the next year before I really started watching football it, this is a team that has continued it seems like ages and the fact that Tom Brady is still playing and still the best quarterback in this league at 41 years of age is outstanding and it is by following that system and that just that will to stick to something and just do it over and over again every single day and it's a message to everyone. It doesn't even go to sports. It, it's, it's life. It is that grind to do and repeat. Rinse, repeat. Rinse, repeat. Something every day that makes you better. And, and that you, this goes down to the young athletes, young kids looking to do something for their life, a career, moving forward. If they want to be an athlete. If you, if you want to be successful... Look at these three teams, four teams. We'll throw in the Golden State Warriors. Look at those teams. And I'm leaning more on the New England Patriots here because that's a, it's been a 17 years and counting thing. UConn's women's basketball, they yeah, they've been all right for a long time, but they also it's just really the last 10 years that they've had a couple outstanding win streaks. And Alabama's been really Obviously, they've been a top program in the country since the beginning of then, over the past century. But the, over the last, since 2008, they've been this dominant. If, if you want to succeed, take notes. Take notes from the New England Patriots, UConn women's basketball, Alabama football, the Golden State Warriors, the New York Yankees. That not lasting right now, but look at that New York Yankees team. It all falls back on that, the just sticking to a plan, sticking to a routine, sticking to just that focus, that mindset. And it's just outstanding, something to see in sports. A lot of people are sick of it. They want New England to be done. Everyone was hoping it was this year. Sorry, folks. It's it's not ending anytime soon, and I've said it multiple times. It's not ending until Tom Brady walks out of that door. Until Bill Belichick walks out of that door. It's not ending. It's the discipline, fundamentals, execution that is passed down from team to team, from year to year, from player to player. It, it, it's passed. I don't care who. It's anyone in the organization. He'd be the freaking towel guy that washes laundry. It, go to the doctor in the locker room. It, it, the ball boys in the sideline. That's it. This is the New England Patriots. It gets passed down to every single person in that organization, and it's been going on for almost two decades. If you want success, look at the domination of these franchises and organizations in today's sports. It's, it's an awesome spectacle, and it will, quite frankly, we'll be telling our grandchildren about it. I oh, remember how good that Patriots team was for a while. Uh, Alabama football, man, they won five, five national championships in like 11 years yeah and, and and you look at all these teams they've all been led by the same person 
Bill Belichick gets it. Nick Saban of Alabama gets it. Gino Ariema of UConn's women basketball, he gets it. They all get it. They know what it takes to win and how to sustain their excellence. And it's the discipline, fundamentals, execution. It's that simple. That's it for today. Thank you for joining here in Cole's Corner. Thank you for listening. I love the listeners. I, I need more feedback. I want to know what you want to hear. I, I love doing this. Cole's Corner, thank you. We will see you either later this week or next week. Have a beautiful night. Watch some college basketball. Can't wait for football this week. Panthers, Steelers, Thursday night. This has been Cole's Corner.